And I believe collectively as a group, we're going to kick the competition's butt because we understand how important it is to think, execute, and dominate. Suck it up! Get tough! Suck it up! Get tough! People want to have success. People want to make a lot of money, but they want it to be easy without any challenges. Do you think it was easy for me to become one of the top 450 basketball players in the world that you never heard of? The only way I made it to the NBA is I was fundamentally sound, I was mentally tough, and I never quit. And even when I wanted to quit, I had people in my life that would make sure I didn't quit. I hired and, and set out the top 10 motivational speakers, watched all their videos, and I watched them one by one because I understand that if I pay attention to what the best are doing, I could be the best too. I watched game film on Michael Jordan. No matter how much I watched, I couldn't do what Michael Jordan can do. I would watch Magic Johnson. I couldn't do what Magic Johnson would do, but I sat there and had these videos. I watched Les Brown, Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins, but my wife was scared. I was scared. I called him to my office and I said what a husband say. I said, babe, we're going to be okay. Every month the checking account is dreaming. I said, babe, we're going to be okay. Let's start a motivational speaking business. I go to Jerry Sloan and I say, Jerry, I'm trying to make your team, but since we don't scrimmage, I feel like I can't show you what I can do. Go to Corral, hear me clearly. Listen to his answer, and it will unlock some mysteries as to how you become the best in the world at what you do over a long period of time. Jerry, I'm trying to make your team, but I feel like I can't show you what I can do. He says, Walter, I already know what you can do, but if you want to make my team, I suggest you listen, follow directions, and execute. Listen, follow directions, and execute. What I didn't realize, even though we didn't scrimmage in practice, throughout practice, we did drills, and he created what I call habits and rituals. Every single day, practice was the same. Every single day, we drilled on fundamentals. Every single day, we worked on the habits and rituals. So even though my mind was floating, even though I was selfish and self-centered, he was conditioning me into the culture through practice of habits and rituals. The reason why I tripled my NBA income in three years is because of habits and rituals. Next year, if your name didn't get called to come across the stage, I'm here to tell you they will call your name next year if you go back home and execute habits and rituals. I wanted to scrimmage for me, but Jerry Sloan was getting me ready to play for the Utah Jazz. So every day, it was about habits and rituals. Having hot food is about habits and rituals. Great customer service is about habits and rituals. Being the best in the world at what you do, being a pro, is all about habits and rituals. Let me tell you something. I learned a very valuable lesson when I played for the Utah Jazz. I had a point guard on my team who's arguably the best point guard in the history of the NBA. His name is John Stockton. John Stockton would go to a chiropractor four times a day on game day. You know what I said to myself? I'm not doing that. It doesn't take all that. John Stockton played 19 years in the NBA. I played three. You would have thought I'd have been smart enough to watch a Hall of Famer and just shut my mouth, hop in the car, and go with them. No! My mind say, yeah, it doesn't take all that. And I would tease him. Man, John Stock, are you uh, OCD or something? Why are you going to a chiropractor four times a day? He swore by his chiropractor. That man played point guard in the NBA until he was 40 years old. And he didn't retire because he got slow. He retired because he refused to wear baggy shorts. He loved his Daisy Dukes. Every day on game day, that man would go to a chiropractor four times a day. And in my immature basketball mind, I would say, eh, it doesn't take all that. I don't need to do all that. I'm an award-winning motivational speaker because now I pay attention to details. Another peak performance truth, peak performers are detail-oriented. 
The reality is this, there are 450 ball players in the NBA every single year. They give out 450 jerseys and there's only 10 superstars. So while the general public focuses on the superstars, professional sports is really made up of guys like me. Every single day I drill the fundamentals. So when I left sports and got into business, I didn't focus on making money. I focused on fundamentals. Because I understood I made it to the NBA because I was fundamentally sound. So when I get into business, if I become fundamentally sound in business, and if I become the best in the world in business, I bet you I can make a whole lot of money. I got recruited coast to coast, and that's how I learned how to sell. The doorbell would ring. These coaches were coming into my living room. They always traveled in a pack of three. They always wore university issued golf shirts. They always had a brochure and they put the brochure on the coffee table. They were always four students on the brochure. Two white, one Asian, and one African American every single time. And sometimes they would sub two, the Asian for a Latino. And as I collected more brochures, I began to recognize some of the same kids on different schools' brochures. And then I realized, you know what? Oh my God, these are students, these are models, and this is big business. Your industry is big business. And whenever you have big business, it's very competitive. But in basketball, if you win by one, you still win. If you win by one, you still win. So when you want to compete at a high level in a very competitive business, you better pay attention to every little detail. Sometimes in franchise systems, when the leader talks about what we need to do, some of you sit there and say, oh, we don't need to do that. I'm not doing that. It doesn't take all that. It don't need to do that. I don't take all that. Some of you guys right now in the open keynote had that thought going to your mind. Oh, I'm not doing that. I don't need new plates. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. You already made up your mind not to do it. Great people. Pay attention to detail. So at this conference, don't you dare let your mind say, oh, I'm not doing that, it doesn't take all that, I'm not doing that, it doesn't take all that, it doesn't, not. you'll be average the rest of your life. Great people pay attention to every single little detail. Peak performers understand that detail matters. Peak performers understand that that's how you kick the competition's butt. Detail. When you win by one, sometimes the smallest little detail matters. I used to think that way. It doesn't take all that. But you know what? In my basketball career, I played three years and I should have had a longer career because I did not pay attention to detail. Peak performers understand that detail matters. Peak performers understand that that's how you kick the competition's butt. The first day of high school, I walked in full of confidence. I believe confidence is arrogance under control. I walked in my first day of high school full of confidence until I passed the principal's office. And he was 6'6", 240 pounds. Everybody else called him Mr. Bond, but I called him Dad. That first day of school was the longest day of my life. I attended high school in Chicago's inner city where my father was a principal of my high school. I got to the lunchroom and I ate lunch all by myself. I could hear my classmates whisper, I couldn't wait to get home. I made up my mind, when I get home, I'm gonna throw a pity party. Go ahead and cry, feel sorry for yourself. Be angry, be frustrated, but I only give you three days. I went home that first day of school and I threw me a three day pity party. You guys don't know me, but I know how to party. Peak performers always think positively. So go ahead and throw your pity party for three days and that's it. Every ever thought after that third day, make sure it's positive. If you see you or feel yourself thinking negatively, stop it right there. And reprogram your mind to think positive. I'll give you three days, go ahead and do it. I do it myself all the time. But I threw that three day pity party and came up with a plan. I'm going back to high school. I'll be starting a baseball team, basketball team, football team, president of my journalism club. My classmates are gonna vote me most likely to succeed. I never made the Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan money. I was terrified of becoming that athlete who went broke. And for months, I saw my checking account dwindle every single month. College educated, college degree, but every month my checking account was dwindling. I had no other skill sets. I had sold out to the sport in which you have to do. To play pro basketball, you gotta sell out. So here I am, 31 years old, wife of three kids, mortgage clicking every single month, and I was scared. 
When I was an immature basketball player, I didn't get that concept. I had another teammate named Carl Malone, who arguably had the best body in the history of the NBA. I would go to restaurants with him, and he annoyed me. I couldn't even imagine what the waitress felt like. He annoyed me. Now, he had the best body of all time in the NBA, but he annoyed me at restaurants. He would order grilled chicken Caesar salads, and he would ask the waitress, when you grill my chicken Caesar salad, could you make sure there's no char marks on my chicken breast? Uh, you want her to levitate the chicken over the grill? I mean, what do you want her to... Very picky, very meticulous with Walter Charmarks have carcinogens. Carcinogens create cancer. I want the chicken breast, but I don't want the cancer. Another time he ordered a chicken salad. This man was 6'9", 256 pounds. He always ate salads, and I rarely saw him clear his plate. Had the best body of all time in the NBA. He ordered a chicken salad one time. It came with hard-boiled eggs. The salad came out. No, no, before the salad came out, he says, I don't want hard boiled eggs. They're high in cholesterol. And we're in Salt Lake City. They all know who we are. We're the only brothers in town. <laughs> well, Mr. Malone, the salads are pre made and the egg is crumbled over the salad. Well, would you mind picking it out for me? He annoyed me. I would go behind his back, I would apologize to the waitress and give her an extra tip. Me? I ate whatever they brought me. French fries? Cool. Gravy? Cool. This is the wrong order. I'll keep this and I'll eat the other food you bring out too. He annoyed me when he ordered food because I thought he was difficult. Carl Malone played 20 years in the NBA. I played three. I actually have motivational speakers calling me, saying, Walter, we're in a recession. I'm thinking about quitting and getting a real job. Now, isn't that an oxymoron? A motivational speaker quitting. You know what I do when I get those phone calls? I motivate them to quit. Because <laughs> in my mind, if it's going to be a dog-eat-dog -dog world, I'm going to be the big dog. And I always ask them a question, because they say, you know, Walter, the economy, the recession, the economy, the recession. I don't trust the media. I was a high school basketball star. I began to deal with the media when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. I understand how the media operates. I understand how they make money. So I always challenge these motivational speakers. Well, if we're in a recession, how do you know? Prove it to me. Answer's always the same. Heard it on the news. What are you allowing the media to do to your mind, your approach, your outlook? Are you kidding me? I could always hear my daddy's voice. I don't care where I was. I could be on a school bus. I could be in the lunchroom. I could be on the playground. I could be somewhere I shouldn't be. I could always hear my daddy's voice. My daddy could protect me on the streets of Chicago when he was not even there. You have children. You have grandchildren. Make sure they can always hear your voice. But most importantly in business, whose voice are you listening to? When it comes to franchising, whose voice are you listening to? When it comes to same day sales, whose voice are you listening to? When it comes down to hiring the right Cassie, whose voice are you listening to? When it comes down to being successful in franchising, whose voice are you listening to? My wife and I are former franchisees. That's why I'm a no-brainer to speak at franchise conferences because every franchise system has typically two groups at the conference. You have the one group that buys in and they're in the corner talking about how can we execute, how can we improve same-day sales. Wow, you're doing good, I'm doing good, let's keep working together. What can we do to improve the brand? We're at the conference, let's buy in. There's always another group over in the other corner. Uh, yeah, man, corporate. <laughs> yeah, corporate. <laughs> Corporates are always trying to sell us something. I know. They're just trying to make money. I know. All that stuff they're talking about, you gonna do it? Nope, you, me either. So every system, trust me, has two different groups at the conference. The group that buys in and the group that's rebels and don't. Here's another record rhetorical question for you. What group are you with?
My college career was over. I got offered a job to become a hospital administrator. Two-year program, $75,000 job. And right before I took the job, my daddy called me on the phone. Let me tell you about my daddy. When I was a little boy, my daddy would always pick me up. When he came home from work, he'd pick me up. When he saw me in the nursery after church, he'd pick me up. No matter how long he worked, no matter how tired he was, my daddy would always pick me up. So when I had my kids, I would always pick up my kids. When I got home, sometimes I was tired. They have a bottle in one hand, and they just lifted up the other hand, and they knew what daddy was supposed to do. My job was to pick them up. This is a spiritual interaction. When you pick up a child, it is a spiritual transaction. When you pick up a child, you change their perspective. When you pick up a child, all of a sudden they can see the world the way you see it. I don't care what your children have done, there is nothing they can do for you to stop picking them up. When my daughter's a drug addict, I don't care, pick her up. My son messes up, I don't care, pick him up. I don't care. You pick them up. That is your job, mama. That is your job, daddy. That is your job, grandma. That is your job, granddad. Your number one job is to pick them up and change their perspective. My saddest day, one day, my daddy looked at me and he said, boy, you're too big, I can't pick you up anymore. But when he couldn't pick me up physically, he would pick me up emotionally. He would pick me up spiritually. I had a great dad because he would always pick me up. He would always change my perspective. So my daddy called me on the phone, he asked me a question. He said, son, you had a tough year, what's next? I said, dad, I'm gonna be a hospital administrator. He said, not bad, but let me ask you a question, son. Do you believe you're an NBA player? You cannot produce yourself in image, son. If you don't think so, go take the job. But if you believe you're an NBA player, go for it. My dad had the self-control and discipline and waited for my answer. And my answer was yes. You're right, Dad. I can't work the rest of my life. But coming in the NBA is a dream. I've had ever since I was a little boy. He said, go for it, son. I limped back into my coach's office with a cast of my foot. Tears in my eyes. I said, Coach, what do I need to do to play in the NBA? He said, do two things you can play in the NBA. Lose 20 pounds and shoot a three-point shot with range, you can play in the NBA. If you lose 20 pounds and shoot a three-point shot with range, you can play in the NBA. I lost 20 pounds, and every day I would shoot 500 shots a day, every single day. I got invited to training camp with the Dallas Mavericks, and not only did I make the team, I became the first ever undrafted rookie free agent in the history of the Dallas Mavericks to start over the night. Could you imagine what was going through my mind? I had not started a basketball game since high school. I got to the arena, they dimmed the lights, and they put the spotlight right on me. Right through the spotlight, I saw my mom, my dad, and all my brothers and sisters. Then I saw my dad. He's pumped my fist. He pumped his fist. And tears stream down my face. Thank you for all those timeouts. Thank you for making sure I was always home when the street lights came on. Thank you for making sure I could always hear your voice. Thank you for always changing my perspective.